now, there we go. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. So this evening, we're really excited to welcome Dr. William Hazeltine here. I'm sure you guys have all seen him in the news, on CNN, on CNBC, on, on everything. So he's, he's been a part of our lives during this whole pandemic and it's, it's, we're so happy to have him here with us this evening. Um, if you don't know about him, uh, he's a leader in medical research and application, having taught at Harvard Medical School. And he's also been part of some groundbreaking treatment work for HIV, AIDS, and cancer. He's written more than 200 peer-reviewed manuscripts and 11 books, including, including two on COVID. And uh, Time Magazine named him one of 20, the 25 most influential global business executives. So that's, that's quite impressive. Um, these days, Dr. Hazeltine serves on the chair as the chair and president of Access Health International and he is an internationally recognized expert on COVID-19. So we're so happy to welcome him here this evening. Um, and with that, go ahead and take it away. Well, thank you very much. And uh, Teresa, it's a real pleasure to speak to you today and to speak to my fellow uh, citizens of uh, Roxbury. Uh, it's certainly been a, a lovely few days and a great place to be uh, in this uh, mid mid spring. Uh, it's a mid-spring, though, that, of course, has been clouded and still is clouded by COVID. What you see on the screen before you is a blow-up representation of the virus that's causing so much trouble. Uh, a very eminent Australian biologist, when asked what a virus is, he said, it's a little bit of trouble wrapped in a protein. Uh, and that's exactly what you're looking at here. You're looking at the virus. Now, to give you an idea of scale, in one milliliter, if you're really highly infectious, there's about 500 million of these in one milliliter. Tiny little bit of fluid, 500 million. That's one of the reasons it's so infectious. And although there were some questions early on about how it's mostly transmitted, it's mostly transmitted through the air. And a more recent paper put it very succinctly. If you're in a closed room with poor ventilation, it doesn't mean it make a difference whether you're six feet or 60 feet away. It's not only the fomites that get you, it floats around in the air for quite a while. And it even comes up through sewer gas. One thing people most really don't understand about this is that later in the disease, it uh, affects the intestines in children, very much so. It comes out with the feces, It uh, can waft up with sewer gas and can cause infections. Uh, so it's not just uh, being around somebody. You've got to be careful. You've got to watch out for sanitation and other issues. And the idea that it's an aerosol doesn't mean that it's not transmitted by surfaces either. Because it's so infectious and getting more so uh, as it varies, uh, it's really the air that you have to worry about uh, for most people. And that's why I personally am going to continue to wear a mask despite what the, S the CDC said. I'm going to be wearing a mask when I go around with people I don't know, going into shops, going to the library, uh, whatever I do. If I'm not with my bubble, I'm wearing a mask and being careful. Uh, but that is an introduction. I'm going to take you on a uh, trip, mostly science. Uh, we're going to go in some cases pretty deep into the, the science. But fundamentally, we want to understand what this virus is doing to us and how it does it. And I'll just outline some of the things that were very evident early on, but most people seem to have missed. This is a coronavirus, which means it's like a virus as we know. About one third of your common colds are caused by coronaviruses. We've tracked them for 60 years. And every year, like the flu, almost exactly like the flu, they come back. All four of them come back. They infect about 20% collectively of the world's population every winter. They subside and then the next year they come back and infect the very same people. And those very same people get the colds. And if you really doubted that that's what's happening, they actually did an experiment about 30 years ago. They took a group of people, infect them with one strain of a coronavirus, waited a year, gave it to them again, and they got infected again, and they got colds again. We knew that from the outset. The moment you knew this was a coronavirus, you knew 
several things about it. Infection doesn't protect you for very long. These viruses are gonna come back like the flu. What we didn't know then, which we know now, is they change like the flu. We didn't know that coronaviruses changed. Nobody bothered to look. They thought, well, maybe it's just waning immunity. No, it's a combination of waning immunity and virus change, just like the flu. One thing you may not know because it's relatively recent is the flu vaccines are only good for about six months. And if you wanna be protected late in the season, take your flu vaccine, not in September, take it in late October and you'll be protected for most of the season. And then the flu virus changes and comes back. And this is a lot like that. There's one big difference. The flu that's currently around kills about one out of 2000 people. This virus kills about one out of 100 to one out of 200. Uh, and that's a big difference when you add up tens of millions, even hundreds of millions of people getting infected. Can we move on to the next slide, please? So this just gives you an idea of what's happening. If you look at the world today, and this is probably underestimate, both in number of cases and a uh, number of deaths, this is a major global pandemic. 164 million people infected today, 3.4 million people have died that have recorded. And that death toll is ticking up pretty rapidly because of what's going on in India and Brazil and some other places. The United States is still the worst country in the world. How in the world we as the richest, one of the richest countries, certainly the most medically sophisticated country in the world, ended up being the worst in the world, accounting for, in the early days, at least 20, 25% of all infections, is a question that we should be asking ourselves for year, years to come. And one of the questions that I'm beginning to think about and many of my friends are is, what can we do so this doesn't happen again? Oh, I think you got muted or something happened. I didn't mute myself. Oh, there you go. You're back. Okay. We missed you for a minute, for a second, though. So anyway, so what I was saying is I want everybody to ask themselves, how do we end up with so many people infected? Worse than any country by far in the world. India's catching up pretty quickly, but remember there's 1.4 times as many Indians. There are 1.4 billion Indians and there are about 340 million Americans. So they've got a ways to go. That's something we should think about. And I, you know, we, we are all thinking about that, trying to do better. Can I have the next slide, please? Now, we think about COVID as a lung disease, but it never was. Uh, it's a multi-organ disease. You get it, you get colds, you get a lung disease. And the first time it was recognized, people were dying of a lung disease. SARS means uh, acute respiratory syndrome. Uh, that's what the uh, R A R D S means in SARS, acute respiratory distress syndrome. So that's what, what's happening, uh, the first presentation. But when you actually look at people who are infected, many organ systems fail. The virus gets in and inflames your blood, your, all your vascular system, and that serves all of your organs. People get liver damage, lung damage, heart damage, kidney damage, brain damage. It doesn't look like the virus gets into your brain, but damaging the vessels around your brain. One thing most people might not think about the brain is every cell in your brain has two little capillaries that go alongside it, every cell. And that means if there's infection in those capillaries that are sending off odd signals, your brain is gonna get infected. And that's why when people really get quite ill, multiple organ systems go off. And one of the things that goes off is coagulation. So you get strokes, people lose legs and limbs, you get clots in your lungs, clots in your brain, clots in your heart, clots all over your body. And there's another major feature of this. I'd say there are two parts of the body that get infected. And 
primarily. One is your lungs. Now, what's interesting about that is most of you probably don't think of your lungs as being outside your body, like your skin. But in fact, they're open to the air. It's a clear passage right down to your lungs. And that's a surface that's open to the outside. And that is where the virus gets in. But that's not the only surface. Human beings are basically a long tube. Think of yourself as a hose with some appendages. From your mouth to your anus, you're a tube. And that's outside your body. When you eat your food, it doesn't go into your body. It stays on the outside and you absorb it. Well, guess where the virus loves to be? In your intestine. In fact, there are more receptors by a factor of 10 or more in your intestine they're in your lungs. And you will hear over time that this disease is a disease of the respiratory surfaces and the intestinal surfaces, both. And that's actually typical of many coronaviruses. That is where they live. Now, let's think about coronaviruses a little more. Where do they come from? Well, first thought is a bat. And that's the correct thought. But how many of you have an image of what a bat cave actually looks like? It looks like a football stadium during the big game, completely crowded, packed, jam packed. That's where this virus has grown up for hundreds of thousands of years. It's infected bats in very dense populations and it's got to fight for its own survival. And it's got to fight not only against other viruses that are there and the bat's immune system, it's got to fight if it wants to keep coming back year after year, it's got to fight against itself. So it's evolved lots and lots of tricks. So it can come in, get out, come back in and get out again, over and over and over. That's happened in bats. And guess what? We look a lot like bats to this virus. There are seven and a half billion of us. It used to be we were mostly rural. Now we're mostly urban, jam-packed. We travel around a lot. About five billion airplane trips per year on a good year. So we look a lot like bats. We fly, not with our own wings, but with wings. We live close packed and there's a lot of us. And the ecological niche is to get out, to get in, get out, come back, get in, get out, back. And we go, well, how does the virus do that? This isn't the only virus that does that. We all know flu. To think of this as flu is probably right. Why do we think it's going to be different from flu? If flu does that and flu vaccines last six months, why should these vaccines last any longer? Or if they last a year, why shouldn't why should these vaccines be so magical? Why should they be different if the virus is behaving in the same way? You know, and the other thing I realized quite early on, you can map coronavirus colds exactly with colds and they up and down, up and down, Northern hemisphere, Southern hemisphere, very precise. So this is really behaving in a way we understand, but would rather not think about because it's much more lethal. If this went on like the flu, instead of 30 to 60,000 people dying every year, it would be 300 to 600,000 dying every year if we aren't able to put it back in its bottle. And so that's why we're paying more attention to this. May I have the next slide, please? So what's going on? This is a picture, the red line shows you an abstract view of the virus getting into your body. You get exposed, you get infected, and eventually the virus peaks, goes away, and you make antibody reactions to it. But there's some very interesting things about this curve. Notice where the peak is, the very point, about day three, two and a half to three. And notice where you first get sick, day five. Well. Why aren't you getting sick when there's so many viruses? The answer is for most viral diseases, what makes you feel sick is not the virus growing in your body. That may surprise you. It's your immune reaction. That's why when you get your flu shot or you get the second shot, like a Moderna second shot, you feel like you've got the flu for a short while. Your body's making a reaction. 
It's the reaction to the virus that you feel, not the virus growing itself. Now, eventually, and some people get really sick, it might be the virus doing a lot of damage, but most people get the virus, it gets in and it gets out before you even know you've had it. That is the flu trick and that is the coronavirus trick. And that's why it's such a dangerous public health gets in and gets out before your immune system has time. Now look at when your antibodies are being made. Pretty slow. They don't actually begin to be made until the virus is already below the contagious limit almost. Take a look at where that crosses over, the blue line and the red line. So is it your antibodies that are wiping out this virus? No, something else is doing that. That something else is called your innate immune system. Innate means you don't have to teach it, it just knows. And your body, like a tree or any other organism, can recognize when stuff shouldn't be in your body in its cells. That's called the innate immune system. Also later, we now have an adaptive immune system that says, hey, I know what this is. I'm gonna really get after it with my antibodies, my T cells, you name it. Now, that's a fundamental part of this virus. It gets in and gets out before you know you've got it. By the way, that's why it can get back in. It can get back in before your, even your memory has seen it. So how can a vaccine possibly work? We'll talk about that a little more. But there's something else that I wanna show you with this slide. And that is, once you have been infected, about 20% of people get pretty sick. 80% of people might not even know they've had it, mild cold, no cold. 20% of people get pretty sick. But they don't get sick when the virus is really around. The virus hits you, it's kind of like getting hit by a car. Boom, you're hit. And it may take you a long time. You may have broken bones, you may have inflammation, it may take you a long time to recover. You have a series of things that happen to you. Cytokine storms, coagulations, late hyperinflammatory flame, any one of these things can kill you. And we're lucky that only about one out of 200, one out of 100 people die. The cousins of this virus, one out of 10 and one out of three people die. This virus is nowhere near its lethal capacity. And it's getting worse, by the way. It's getting worse in two ways. The curve I show you here is from the very early strains. But the strains that are now mostly circulating spread out that asymptomatic phase longer. You have more virus for a longer time. You're contagious for a longer time. And more people are getting sick. So you go to India, you're getting 20 years, I've had people who work for me, I have an operation in India. Some people who've worked for me have died. About half of them are infected and many of their friends and relatives have died. This is real time. Yesterday, today, every day, I hear people dying who we know, even who work for us. That's how bad this new strain is. It's not COVID-19. COVID-21 is not COVID-19. It's a much meaner critter. It's much more infectious. Let me just give you an infectivity scale. If Wuhan was one, last February, a first variant came out, which we'll call two, it's called B1. Late summer, a new variant came out in UK called B117. Let's call that four. And now the Indian strain, 6172, we'll call eight. Eight times more infectious than it was. That means less virus, less time, Used to be somebody in family got infected, maybe one or two people would be. Now everybody in the family gets infected. This is a different critter and you have to be careful. That's why I'm being careful. I have the, okay, so now the conundrum. We're gonna talk a little bit about how the virus does it. This is a sneaky, stealthy virus. Gets in, gets out before you know it. And that's how it's evolved. It's evolved to get around our immune system in many ways. Next slide, please. So this is something, I'm a molecular biologist, a virologist. Uh, I was the first one to sequence the HIV genome, uh, followed very closely, matter of days by a French group. We got the same sequence more or less. But this is genomics. 
What we did when we sequenced the AIDS virus is we understood the virus from its sequence before we understood much about it. And the power of genomics is, as you've seen it with this, the moment you have the sequence, you have the tools in your hand for medical interventions. And when the Chinese published that sequence, made it available, within days, actually over a weekend, a vaccine was created at the NIH. Within two days. That's how powerful genomics is. If we didn't have genomics, it could take us 20 years to do it. That's how long it used to take. Genomics has transformed, and that's why I started a company, Human Genome Sciences, to do what we can do for a virus for all human genes. And that is now how we approach any medical problem, whether it's cancer or heart disease or brain disease, we start with the genes and we work forward. It used to take us from a disease 20 years. Here, in a matter of weeks, by uh, a few weeks from understanding this was a disease, we had the total sequence and we were making vaccines. That's why we've been uh, uh, so successful. Um, genomics has been really a, a tremendous power. Now, this doesn't mean much to you, most of you. It's just some pretty colors, and, but it means a lot to people like me. You've seen the backbone, all the pieces of the virus. Each one of these things, they have one, two, three, four, five, is something I think of as a concrete item, which I can understand and change and stop this virus from doing its job. Every one of these. Now, the things that are in orange and red, if I knock them out, the virus can't go in tissue culture. The ones in green, the virus is fine in tissue culture, but it's not fine in animals. You need every single one of these things, except number eight, to cause disease in animals and in people. Now, the most interesting part of the view, virus to many people, not to me, but to many people, is the outside. I have the next slide, please. Called SS1, this too. Those are those little things at the beginning, the red balls of the outside of uh, sort of the spike. Why is that? Because that's where the vaccines are directed against. That's what's in the vaccine. You stick the gene here called S1, S2. You stick that into, uh, uh, somehow you get the body to make it. The immune system recognizes it. And that's the basis for our vaccines. That's it right there laid out. And that's what they did over the weekend. They took that gene out, popped it into something and bingo, that was the beginning of, uh, of the vaccine. Now what I show you with all these little numbers is variations. What is a variant? It's a mutation. And what's a mutation? It's a change, a single letter change in the nucleotide, there are 30,000 nucleotides in this thing, changes one letter, changes the amino acid, can change the function. Let's just look at this one down at the bottom called 4E48Q. In most of the nasty viruses, it's called E484K. It's actually got a nickname called Eek. If you're infected with one of the Eek viruses, not the Eekwa, e E484Q, your immune system doesn't see it very well. You combine that with L452R, you've got a real problem because the immune system really can't see that very well. And not only that, it latches onto your cells better, it replicates faster. That's what's killing people in India, 617. It's got these two plus a few others. But notice it's got other ones too. And each one of those is doing something. So let's move forward. This is just showing you that what I mentioned at the beginning, the virus is in not only in competition with the bat's immune system and all the other non-coronaviruses that are in the bat cave, it's in competition with itself. And that's happening right now with us. This is, notice the time scale in the bottom, September through May. And here you see the colors of the different kinds of strains of virus. It started out, you don't even see it, B1, then it went to B177, you see that in pink. Then all of a sudden a new strain you called the UK strain popped up and you see what's happening. Right now the Indian strain has arrived and you'll see it's just taking over. So you see it, that upper little corner uh, is taking over in May. May I have the next slide please. What's happening in India? Well, this looks kind of crazy in a lot of colors. But take a look at the purple color over at the far right. That's 617, that one. 
And look how it's displaced almost everything else and how fast it did it. March 1st, hardly there. April 1st, that's about all there is. You look at right now, 672 has just taken over gosh knows how much. And it's causing real troubles. Is that going to happen anywhere else? Next slide. Well, we're seeing it happening in the UK, but let me just say what's happened in the UK, I mean, the US. You know, we knew we had a virus back in uh, January of this year. And all last year was mostly B1.2. But then sometime around last summer, this time last summer, other strains started to appear. You see them in different colors. And you probably didn't pay much attention to that. But over time, when the British strain arrived, look where it is today. Look how much of that strain. In fact, almost nobody's getting infected with the original virus anymore. That's what the vaccine is made to. It's made to be 1.2. And even before that, it's actually made to something earlier. So now we're infected by a virus that's not even being vaccinated against. That doesn't mean it won't work. That means some time for caution. Remember where that is on the infectivity scale. If Wuhan was one and B1 was two, this one's four. And that's why you may have friends when one member of the family is infected, they're all infected. And 617 is here too. Next slide. This just shows you here in Connecticut where we are. Okay, a lot of us, B117 is all over the place. That's a UK strain that caused so much trouble. The uh, uh, green strain is our own homegrown strain. Um, and um, it looks like the British strain is out competing it, but out competing all of those is 617. I have the next slide, please. Okay, now I mentioned the virus gets in and gets out. And I've also mentioned it gets in and gets out again. And it gets in to people who are vaccinated as well. I just did read a paper just before coming online. And uh, there's a big study out of Israel that tells you about how many people get infected. Suppose we vaccinate 100 million people and we finish the vaccination. If what happened in Israel happens in the United States and we vaccinate 100 million people within the first two weeks, 400,000 will get infected and 120,000 will get sick. Now that is a great vaccine. I have to start off by saying it's a fantastic vaccine, but that still means a lot of people, even with 95% plus efficacy, a lot of people are gonna get infected. And you're gonna hear a lot of news like the Yankees. It's not unexpected, but remember of those 400,000, 120,000 get sick. If you ask why I'm wearing a mask, that's why I'm wearing a mask. And that isn't even with a new strain. So when people call these variants scariants, they're scary. The people who don't think they're serious. These are serious. They're not something to take lightly. Now, there has been the idea that this virus is going to get out and get weak. And maybe that will happen. But on what time scale? Maybe it won't happen. What's been happening is getting more transmissible and more lethal every few months. That's what's actually happening now. And the nastier strains are pushing out what we were afraid of six months ago as a more mild strain. And it's moving down the age range. It grabs all the fewer receptors. And now we're having hospitals filled with people with 30, 40, and in India, 20 up. And a lot of children as well. And when I mean children, I mean five and up. So those are things to think about. Now, how is it doing this? Well, it cloaks itself and it has a bunch of different ways to do it. It's not the only virus that does it. Influenza does it, respiratory syncytial virus does it, but it is its way of living. So what does it do the first thing? First, it goes in and the very first thing it does is that I wanna make a new home for myself. If there are messenger RNAs, things that can make RNA, can make proteins, I wanna take it over, I wanna get rid of all those. So it starts chopping them up. And it says, anything that's new, you can't get out of the nucleus. I do all my stuff out in the cytoplasm. I'm gonna shut off your exit. I'm gonna close it down so you can't get out. And even if you're trying to make a signal, like an alarm system that tells you something wrong, you can't really do it because not only if you can't get out of the nucleus, and if you're in the cytoplasm, I'm gonna chop you up. 
And the only thing that doesn't really get chopped up is the viral RNA because it's got a special structure. Kind of think of it wrapped up with a bow at one end. And it says, don't chop me up because it's the virus is chopping it up. It doesn't want to chop up itself, but it chops up the messenger. So the first thing it does, it clears the ground for itself. Now, the next thing it does, and it, every cell is built in, has built in three or four different ways to say, something is in me which I don't recognize, and I'm gonna trip the alarm. Think of it as the cell's fire alarm. A fire is starting, it has a signal, it recognizes the heat. This time it recognizes RNA or protein, it recognizes something should be there, sends a signal, goes to the nucleus, Proteins are made, those are called interferons. Get made, those interferons get out, they go even to other cells, they trigger a whole nother set of early responses. So there's first responders, which are the interferons, and there's second responders, which are a whole bunch of other things, which is the whole immune system, okay? First thing, by wiping out the ability to have anything exit the nucleus, you've cut one of the major wires to that alarm system. Second, you build a special compartment for yourself where you're invisible. May I have the next slide, please? Next slide, please. Here it is. We have a slice through a cell. And this is so, okay, you can't, this is the uh, schematic of the R where you're looking at the RNA in here. It builds its own little structure out of cell components. It's got its own pieces here. But it hides in there from the rest of the cell. It says, I want to see you. If you shouldn't be there, double-stranded RNA and other things, it hides and it replicates in there. Now, the other thing it does, which is very clever, if you look over at the uh, bottom right, that yellow thing, it's got a little red spot on the side, the bottom one right there. That's a pore. It makes its own pore so the RNA can get out. And that's a whole complex thing. And that's a, one of the very first things it does. Chops up all the rest of the RNAs, stops things from exiting, makes its own little home. And in that home, it's like secret inside the cell and it's not gonna trip any alarms. It's like all of a sudden the fire could put a shield around itself and nobody knew there was a fire in the house until it got too big. Go back one slide, please. Two slides. Okay, so the next thing, it has this unique replication strategy. I'm not gonna go into that. But there is something else it does. In order not to trip the alarm, it also modifies the RNA it makes. So it looks exactly like cellular RNA, except for this bow at the beginning that protects it from getting chopped up. So it's another way of hiding and masking itself. Now, we're gonna skip forward a couple of slides here. Okay, next, next. Uh, this virus carries with it a special little package of genes. These are called accessory factors. I point out you don't need them to replicate in a cell, in a test tube, but without these, the virus is not dangerous. What these do, and many, many different ways of shutting off that signaling system. I'm not gonna go into all those ways, only to say it's absolutely fascinating biology. And it's all of what I'm telling you is going to be important for developing drugs to help stop this disease. So there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Actually, there are nine of nine or ten of these genes. Okay, let's move forward. So this is just giving you a schematic for those of you biologists. The virus goes in; it makes double-stranded RNA, and if you don't hide yourself. That triggers a whole reaction that makes interferon. And that then, the interferon, triggers another response that makes all these other genes that activates the immune system. And here's a schematic of all the things that it does. And we're figuring out more things every day. The point, the point. This is how the virus gets in and hides itself and gets out before your body even knows it's there, before you've made an immune system. What does that mean if you're already infected? Well, if you've got a lot of antibodies, which you do right after you've been vaccinated, and the same virus comes back in, those antibodies are gonna glom onto the virus, the particle, and stop it. But once that particle gets in a cell, 
it's hidden. It can't, because antibodies aren't going to get it. And it's going to do its thing. And it's going to silence the immune system. And may I have the next slide. And I'm going to talk about vaccines and immunity. Here is a chart that most people don't see, but it's published. How good is each of the vaccines and how long are they going to work? All this is data that's published. I'm not showing you anything new. Pfizer, Moderna. Initially, it protects 95% of people. Sputnik, 92%. Convalescent serum, 88%. Biotech, the Indian vaccine, 80%. Johnson & Johnson, 67%. AstraZeneca, 62%. The Chinese vaccine, 50%. How many days is it supposed to be 70% efficacious? Well, look at this. No days for a, a adenovirus, Johnson & Johnson, AstraZeneca, or coronavirus, zero days. It may be 50% effective. It means half the people who are exposed are gonna get infected. And then look what happens for 50%. So 50%, you're a little bit better off, okay? But for some of the vaccines, you're not better, better off. And what are people getting in India? They're not getting Pfizer, Moderna. They're getting these other things. Okay, so next slide. And what is, you know, I published this picture a number of months ago, predicting what would happen. Vaccination, you get a good bolus, you get a lot of antibodies on this, this is time. We didn't know what the time was here. I had no idea what the time was gonna be, but we knew this was happening. Actually, I did have an idea. I thought this would fall off at about, I thought six months would be about here, here or here. It turns out six months is right here, okay? So for, a, this is with a good vaccine. And the better the vaccine, the higher this point, the longer this goes out. So this is natural infection, not as good as a good vaccine, okay? This is sort of a medium vaccine. And so this point at which you're no longer protected from uh, many of the variants is about six months with a good vaccine, the best vaccine, Moderna, no longer protected, at least judged by neutralizing antibodies. Now, people are going to say, does that make, are you going to not get sick? Maybe you're not going to get infected, but maybe you're not going to get sick. We don't know the answer to that. I suspect you won't get, not as many people will get sick, but some people are going to get sick. So this vaccine is probably going to, that's why you're going to start hearing about boosters. And you're already hearing it six months to a year. You're going to get need boosters, especially against the variants. And natural infection is a lot worse. Next slide. What does a booster do? Well, that's what a booster does. Peak for first immunization, second immunization, third immunization, much better, longer, but not forever. We're all boosted with influenza time and time and time again, and we still get infected. Why is this different? It isn't different, it's the same. These viruses are doing the same thing as if this virus is more sophisticated than the other ones. Let me just say, it's not to the advantage of the virus to kill us. It just wants to get its selective advantage is getting from one person to another. If people die, that's not even necessarily good for the vaccine, for the virus. If too many people die, it's actually bad for the virus because it's running out of new people to infect. But it, its job is to get from one person to the other efficiently. And if it has to kill some people to do that, it's kind of a bad side effect, adverse event for it, but it really doesn't matter as long as it doesn't kill too many. That's looking at the world from a virus perspective. From our perspective, it's a lot worse. Next, next slide, please. Okay, so is there anything we can do? Well, once you've got that late disease, there's still not much you can do. We have gotten a lot better, just medical practice. When this thing first appeared, and remember it was the milder form of the virus, it was 90% lethal for people who went into the ICU. In the US is now about 30% lethal. And that isn't because we have any magic drug. It's because medical practice figured things out. Doctors talk to each other like crazy. This works, I don't do this. I flip people over. I don't use the air pressure the same way. I give them some dexamethasone. I watch out for clotting. And so we do better and we're saving a lot of people who would have died. But we don't have any really good drugs for that. And even today people are, it's a kind, I have to say, it's kind of like, toxic shock. 
We still don't have any good drugs for toxic shock either, by the way. There's a lot of things we haven't solved yet. Uh, we're working on it, but we don't have the solutions yet. Next slide. But there are, besides vaccines, ways to stop people from getting infected. Prophylactic treatment with drugs. Because we have no vaccine for HIV, we have to rely on drugs. If people are infected, we can treat them with combinations of drugs and keep them alive for 30 years or more now. If people are exposed, we can prevent them from getting infected by giving the drugs before they even are exposed. It's called prophylactic chemotherapy. And we're getting better and better at that. Now with AIDS, it's really tough because you have to treat really healthy people for a long time. With this disease, if somebody's exposed, it's gonna be a short period of time you need to treat them. So you need a whole series of drugs. And we're now in the process of developing those. And the way this is gonna play out is vaccines will be, first of all, our first line of defense is public health. And the point I wanna make about that, this virus is trying to crack every code it can just by random mutagenesis. It's like a machine trying to beat a chess master, throws lots of combinations. First thing it's got to defeat is your immune system. It does a pretty good job at that. Second thing it's got to deal with is our socio-political setup. How well our government works, how obedient we are, do we follow the rules? We also, if somebody tells us to wear a mask, if somebody tells us to stay indoors, if somebody tells us we have a lockout for a while, are we obedient or not? Some socio-political groups are and some aren't. You can eliminate this almost completely by socio-political means alone. And that's what one fifth of humanity has done, China. Everybody beats up China. For me, I wanna learn what they've done. A country of 1.5 billion people where maybe two people have died in the last nine months of COVID. The rates of COVID you can count on one hand and two, to and two feet, your toes, even less one hand a day where we have 30,000 a day and we think we're doing well. I mean, what is wrong with us? Other countries are doing it too. And you can say they're not human beings. They are human beings. I have offices in China, they're great people. So that's the first way. And it's just frustrating like crazy that countries can control it, but we can't. We have to accept that we can't. That's who we are. Maybe for good, maybe for bad, but it's who we are. So the other way to do it is through medical means. Vaccinate everybody. Not everybody's gonna get vaccinated. So you're gonna try your best with that. And then we're gonna have a combinations of drugs. So if you're exposed, you're gonna popping pills. We're gonna take pills in two, three years from now, maybe hopefully sooner, that if somebody in your school, somebody in your home, somebody in your workplace infected, you pop a pill and it works in combination with vaccines to make sure you're not gonna get infected and get sick. And if you should get sick, there are plenty of drugs we're gonna have that if you catch it early enough, catch it early enough, you can stop it. And why I say catch it early enough is remember, after a few days, there's just no more virus left. So an antiviral drug isn't gonna do you any good. So that's how this is gonna play out over time. Vaccination, combination with some mitigation, combination with a bunch of drugs, but that takes time. It's not gonna be over soon. It's gonna take us time to get to a point where me, I myself feel comfortable that this is under control. I remember as you do, when this was a Chinese problem that never was coming here. I remember when this was a European problem that we were worried about, but weren't concerned. I remember being in New York when I heard nothing but night and day ambulances and there was a morgue on 72nd Street on the Upper East Side on the street with 40 bodies in it. That's what I remember. And then I remember the four waves, especially the third wave where 300,000 Americans a day were getting infected. And I look around the world today and I see it's in hot spots. It's here, it's there, it's here. Now it's over there. Will it come back? You know, I give you something to think about. I know people who work in a big hospital in Delhi. Half of their doctors 
fully vaccinated, got infected, and many of them got sick and some died. That's something for you to think about as you think about what your life is going to be like over the next few years. Yes, we can do it. Humans have the capacity to beat this, but we have to use every tool at our disposal. I'm happy to take some questions now. We can't hear you. Sorry. <laughs> We do have some questions on here. Um, I guess we'll just go down the list. Um, can you explain why the 1918 flu disappeared after just a few years? Nobody knows. <laughs> That's the actual answer. The suspicion is that um, it disappeared because there was a lot of immunity. But you know, the fact of the matter is it didn't disappear. The flu you get every year you'll get next year, is a piece of the 1918 flu. About, flu has seven different, think of chromosomes, seven different, actually sometimes nine, maybe I'm wrong, maybe it's, when I was learning it has seven, I think it has nine now. But it's got a bunch of different chromosomes. And two or three of those chromosomes are the ones in your current flu. It kind of just evolved. Did it get more mild? Yeah, it did. I'll tell you one thing where, everybody's expecting is there's something else that's kind of interesting. Flu comes from birds. Coronaviruses come from bats. And there's something every kid will tell you that's in common between a bird and a bat. They fly. Now, why should that be the commonality? The answer is, I think, in order to fly, you've got to use a lot of energy. When you use a lot of energy, it's like exercising a lot. Your muscles get sore. They get sore because they get inflamed. If you were a bird or a bat and you had our immune system, you'd burn up. You'd be dead. So they downplay all of their immunity, their, their inflammation. And that's great for the virus because the virus doesn't kill them. Great home for them. It kills some of us. Same thing with the flu. It does the same kind of thing. So. The hope, and I've read it, you've read it, this is gonna get weaker over time. It's gonna be just like the cold virus. It's gonna be like the flu, no big deal. Yeah, maybe, but I can't tell you. Can't look into the crystal ball. All I can see is what's in front of me. And I see every few months, a new variant popping up. It's more infectious and more dangerous than the one before. 617 is about eight times more infectious than the Wuhan strain. It's not getting better, it's getting worse. And then I ask myself, how bad can it get? Instead of killing one out of 200, you can kill one out of three. That's what these viruses can do when they get really nasty. So there's a lot of room. Other people are saying, well, it can't change very much. I look at flu, there's no end to the changes. And then I look at the cold viruses that have come back every year since we first found them 60 years ago. Well, maybe, a hundred years from now, it'll run out of ability to change, but I doubt it because it's evolved. Remember these things evolved over hundreds of thousands of years in conditions where they got to come back every year. That's what they figured out. And so that's what we're really facing. We can beat it, but it's not going to be simple and it's not going to be quick. Um, another question. Do viruses tend to mutate toward lower rather than higher virulence in their host? The same question time? that you just asked. Exactly oh, okay. the same question. Same one. And that's the question I answered. Let me talk yeah. about HIV. HIV mutates like crazy, more than any other virus. And if you don't treat them, it's still 99% lethal. And that's we've known HIV in human populations now since uh, 1980. So that's 40 years still killed 99% of people in effects without drugs. So there's the answer to that is not necessarily. Mm. Some viruses get worse, some stay the same, some might get more, more mild. Okay, I'm gonna go, let's see, there are, there are a lot of questions. Um, somebody asked, can you explain the difference between RNA, DNA and mRNA? <laughs> uh, I would recommend you get a high school biology text. They'll do it really well, but I'll try. Uh, DNA is a stable polymer 
Um, and uh, actually my mentor uh, as a graduate student was James D. Watson, who you might know from Watson Crick. And I grew up with him when I was a young scientist, he was writing the book, the Molecular Biology, and that laid out what's called a central paradigm of, uh, of biology. There's variations, but the central paradigm is DNA is inherited from one person to another. It's in your cells. Think of it as the master library. Okay, it's a whole, it's, it's the library of Congress. Then RNA gets copied little, when you want to do something, right, like one cell or another cell to do something, you have to copy the information that's there. And that's called RNA, messenger RNA. And then that gets threaded through a machine that turns it, that particular piece of RNA into a particular protein. Messenger RNA is the RNA which carries the information to make proteins. Now, the, so that's what DNA RNA protein is. If you're asking about the mRNA vaccines, what they are is a piece of RNA, which in this case makes the surface protein of the virus, that S protein. And when you put it into a cell, it tricks the cell into making that protein. And so you jab it into your arm, it's in a little lipid package, it gets into a few cells, those cells start making the protein. And by the way, you can measure the protein it's making. Those proteins then get into your blood, your antibodies see it, you make antibodies to it, and that's how you get vaccinated. Okay. Thank you. Um, you talked about this a little bit already, but um, just to go over it one more time, someone asked other coronaviruses such as MERS and SARS for the most part have disappeared. Can you please explain why why, and can the same happen to COVID-19 or COVID-19? Uh, it's not gonna happen to COVID-19. Uh, let me say there are four coronaviruses, actually five, but four we've tracked very closely. First picked up in the early 60s. Every year they come back, same form. They're variants, just like flu is a variant. Have they gone away at all? No. The same people get infected with the same virus and get sick? Yes. So the, 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 the standard coronavirus, that once it gets out there in the world, it just hangs around forever. And probably these viruses have been around in human beings for a very, very long time. Now, uh, why did SARS and MERS disappear. There were two or two reasons. And by the way, MERS has still not disappeared. MERS is still around. People die of MERS every year. And a lot of them are dying in Africa, not even counted. Okay, it's been recently discovered there's an ongoing continual MERS epidemic in Africa that has just recently been recognized. It came from a bat cave in Egypt to a camel. Uh, they sent camels over to uh, Saudi they infected camel drivers. Some of those camel uh, tenders uh, infected other people. But it's not very infectious in humans. It's not well adapted to us. That's what happens with MERS. It kind of is resident in camels. Camels get a really nasty cold. And if you want to see something ugly, it's a camel with a cold. That is an ugly thing to see. But a camel with a cold gives it to a person and some people very rarely give it to other people. So it's still burning along. now. So the first SARS-1 is a different story. Um, it was not nearly as transmissible. It was a lot more lethal. Uh, it killed one out of 10 people. Uh, MERS kills about one out of three people, it affects. But it wasn't very transmissible. It was could be caught, but it's uh, R0, or the, the rate of the number of people who was infected was too low. And because it, the was most infectious when people were sick. You could actually find the people who were sick and contain those people and they stopped spreading it. Whereas this virus comes out before you're really sick. So people are running around spreading it before you get sick. So there's two different things that happen, not so infectious. And it showed itself very early when it was infectious so you could control it. It didn't just die away, we stopped it. it didn't just disappear, we stopped it. We being mostly people in Asia through um, public health control. Uh, there are a couple questions about treatment. Um, just a quick plug here. Our talk from last week with Cyril Kuhn of Regeneron was rescheduled to next, a week from today, next Wednesday. Um, so hopefully you all can join us for that. Um, 
but the, the treatment questions were uh, some of the best hospitals in the US for treatment, um, any place you would recommend, and can you talk a little bit about the different therapies? Um, once you get the really serious disease, you better be in a great hospital. The really great hospitals, the ones in New York, for example, the big hospitals in New York, can manage it. And if you get really seriously ill, there's a good chance they can save your life. As you go down the scale of good hospitals, it gets harder and harder to save your life. But that's true for any disease. You know, I'll tell you something that happened to me very early on. Maybe it's not the best story for Roxbury because we're not in New York City, but, or, but we're near Yale, we're near New Haven. Uh, we're not too far from Hartford or Boston where they have some of the best hospitals in the world. But I uh, had a problem. I was sitting in the hospital with a, uh, I had an operation on my sinuses. And the guy next to me was a hockey player who had a dent, really a dent in his forehead. Now you think there's a hard bone there? No, you have a sinus behind your forehead and it's hollow before you get to the little bone that protects your brain. He had a dent. Somebody hit him with a hockey stick. So I said, why are you here? You're from the North Shore. He said, look, the guys that got the B are at my hospital. The guys that got the A's are here at Mass General. So my answer, if you are starting to get really sick with SARS or with this disease, COVID, get yourself to the best hospital you can because it make, can make a life and death difference. And that's true for every disease, by the way. Um, one of the benefits for my friends is I'm connected to a lot of the best hospitals in Boston. <laughs> and I tell them, the difference between knowing me, and, the, and all of you are going to recognize this phenomenon, the difference between knowing me and getting an appointment is six hours versus six months. And that's unfortunately true for the great doctors because they're so damn busy. There's just too much work for them to do. And it's one doctor referring to another doctor. That's how it works. If you want to get into the best places, you'd have to, like everything in this world is just about, you have to know how to do it. Mm -hmm. But you got a bunch of people that are going to come knock on your door now. <laughs> <laughs> um, moving on to another question. Somebody asked about the Wuhan lab. Um, what are the odds that it came out of the Wuhan lab? And um, can, can you talk about the death rate after vaccine, if you get infected after vaccination? Um, let me answer the first question, second question first. We don't have enough data on, to answer that second question. Will there be deaths after vaccination? Yes. Will there be many? Probably not. Uh, we just don't know the answer. We're begin just beginning to get the infection rate after the first few weeks of vaccination. And it's pretty low, it's not zero. Uh, it's about 0.4% uh, oh, within the first two weeks of vaccination with the best vaccines uh, and, the, and some of the common strains. It's a lot worse than that for some of the other strains. Will people get sick and die? There will be some. Uh, and it also depends on the person's immune status. I mean, there's a lot of variation um, with age and with other immune system uh, abnormalities and uh, cancer histories. Uh, it's, it's, it's a, the demographics is, is really complicated. The Wuhan lab question is my least favorite question uh, because I see that as a political question more than a real question. The chances that it came out of that lab, from my understanding of the science, is very low. The reason for that is that we now know there were many cases of COVID-19 in China outside of Wuhan. Now that doesn't mean it didn't come from the lab, but that doesn't mean that was the first place it was ever been seen. It was seen outside in Southern China, Shanghai, Hangzhou, and other places a few weeks before. Uh, that seems to be a spreader event. The best data that I've seen, and I've looked at it pretty carefully, it looks, does not look like it was made. Now, it may have been. I doubt it, but it may have been. To me, that isn't the question. What I wish people would do when they look at China is figure it out how, without a vaccine or a drug, they contained it. And why haven't we? That's the question I'm more interested in not blaming somebody from leaking it from a lab. If you want to talk about blaming leaking from a lab, I, my post office was infected because an American took anthrax and put it into envelopes. Anthrax that was made in a bioweapons lab in Fort Detrick in one of these P4 facilities. That's a real leak where people died. 
And actually, as a result of that, I created a drag, drug to uh, save you if you're infected with anthrax in case somebody decided to do it again. Okay, and that drug is now stockpiled by the US government. But uh, leaks have happened. They've happened in the past, it does happen. Um, but do I think it was a leak? I don't think so, but that is to me the most important question. The most important question is how do we control this now that it's out? Yeah. Um, and nobody, nobody, by the way, blame SARS or MERS on labs. The reason we have those labs, we have those labs too, by the way, Wuhan type labs. They're in Singapore, they're in uh, Australia, they're a bunch of labs. You want us to work on this virus. You want us to figure out how it works. You want us to figure out drugs that can stop it. That's what we do as scientists. We've got to work on it. So we, and I wish we'd done a lot more work on it so we were more prepared for this thing. We basically pulled the plug on all the research starting uh, in about 19, you know, 2004, oh, it's over, let's forget it. That was a big, big mistake. Let's hope we don't make it again. Definitely. Um, so Ron at, uh, mentions reading a, a clinical finding last week in long haulers, that they found DNA sequences from the tail of COVID-19. Can you talk a little bit about long haulers? Yeah, that's haulers? really interesting. Um, it's not just long COVID, you know, for why? For this is something that other people should think about. All of us should think about the idea that you can take a nasal swab and tell whether you're infected or not has got some holes in it. If you test negative, that doesn't mean you're not infectious. You're still pooping out infectious virus for a few more weeks. About half the people, and about five percent of people, are enough to really cause serious trouble. That's why, if you want to go to China. You have to do something you never even heard about called an IgM test. An IgM test goes is antibodies, first ones are made. They come up and about seven or eight weeks, they're gone. If you're IgM positive, you can't go to China. It says you haven't been infected for seven weeks. They don't want you to be infected for seven weeks. Why? Because this virus gets into your gut and you're pooping out live virus on average for at least three or four weeks. That's just to start with. That means if you're in a country you're going in that country and you're in, a, in isolation for two weeks. That's not enough. That's why they're doing fecal and anal swabs before you can get out and run around China. That's why if you've been infected, they keep you in until you're negative. So people can be infected a lot longer and from the eyes too. I can tell you there are papers where people have virus in their eyes for 30, 40 days after clearing it from the nasal pharynx. Now there's another phenomenon and I showed that curve, that red curve. Can we go back to that red curve? Can you, I'll show you something interesting about the curve. Go all the way okay. back. <laughs> what it shows is there's a very, very long tail of red. Yeah, go back, yeah, there it is. Now take a look. That red line doesn't go to zero. It's well below infectious, but there's still RNA there. And there's RNA there for two reasons. There's some cells that could replicate part of the RNA. But there's a great paper done by a friend of mine, Rudy Yadish at MIT. We went, we were in school at the same time. And uh, he did a brilliant experiment. And he said, well, maybe you could go from RNA to DNA and your, your cells have that ability. Uh, and you have something called jumping genes, which is kind of interesting. But what the jumping genes are, can take RNA, convert it into DNA and stick it at random places along your genome. Now, you may have heard that 99% of your DNA doesn't make proteins, it's kind of all sorts of detritus. And about 10% of that is remnants of former viral infections over the last 500 million years. Okay, that's what's happened. And so occasionally the RNA will get copied into DNA and that'll get stuck into your cells. And it shows up in a really interesting way. Half of it's going the right way, half of it's going the wrong way. And that's another reason you're getting this long tail. So three reasons you're getting a long tail. First, you're truly infectious in your gut, but not your nasal pharynx. Second, you're making a little bit of pieces of the RNA. And three, you're integrating it. Now, he had an interesting, whoever gave that question, it's a very sophisticated question because you said the tail. Why the tail? That's really interesting. Remember all those little green genes I was showing you? 
those were on the tail. And you make about 10 times, 20 times, actually many more than a thousand times, more of those that you make about anything else. And that's why those are the ones that end up integrated into DNA because there's just so much more of them. That's Bill's view. I don't know if that's true, but that's how I look at it. That was a sophisticated question. <laughs> well, that was that was courtesy of of Ron, our, our local biologist, <laughs> so, <laughs> Ron Faunus. Um, so we're gonna wrap this up in just a second, but I, I did want to ask one more question. Um, you know, we're entering the new phase here in Connecticut, where you know we're in limbo with the masks. You still gotta wear your mask at the library, everybody. Um, and somebody asked. Uh, about the e efficacy of the masks that most people wear, the, the paper ones, the cloth ones. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? What do you use? Right. Uh, the answer to that is shown by flu. Flu has disappeared this year. Not that it's gone, it's just that whatever we're doing is stop flu all over the world. Southern hemisphere, Northern hemisphere, it turns out it's not as infectious as the coronaviruses. So if you wear your mask, even if some people wear your mask, you're lowering the transmission enough so you've wiped out flu. I hope that next winter everybody puts on a mask, a little paste by surgical mask. So I don't get the flu again. I've had it five times in my life. It ain't fun. My definition of when is, you know, people call a lot of things the flu. My definition is when you have influenza, is you're sick and you can't get out of bed. Okay, that's the definition. You're so sick, you can't actually get out of bed. Okay, that means you've got the real flu. But if you get out of bed and complain, you don't have the real flu. At least that's what's happened to me a number of times. So the masks are working. Are they perfect? No. Are the new variants more likely to get through masks? Yes. I wear a mask today, being vaccinated myself, uh, with, to protect myself as much as people from me. I don't think I'm a high probability of infecting anybody, but I think other people might be infecting me. And so if I'm in going to a shop, I wear an N95. If I'm at home and working outside and there's some workman comes, I wear a paper mask. If I go to a shop, I wear an N95. If I were to get on public transportation, like a plane or anything, I would wear a face shield and a mask because it gets into your eyes. Most people don't think about that, but the virus infects you through your eyes. And there are papers that show that um, on airplanes, for example. So um, that's that's what I do. That's what I would still recommend. You know, the analogy that I use is a pretty simple one. Think about the weather. When you go outside, you say, is it sunny? If it's sunny, fine, go out, have fun. If it's a light drizzle, you put on something. That's the analogy is how many people are infected. If there's very, very few infected people in your area, that's a sunny day, like one per thousand a day or one per 10,000 a day, whatever you feel comfortable with. That's a sunny day, you go out, relax. If it's a light drizzle, that's a yellow. You're moving from green to yellow zone. That means you use some protection. You know, if you're going with a lot of people, wear an N95, if you're with a few people, maybe a paper mask. If it moves into orange or red, especially orange and red, then you'd be much more careful. It's kind of like a, a thunderstorm. And in some cases, we've gone through times when it's been like a tornado where you stay in your basement. You just don't go out, right? And we've all lived through that. And so that's how you should think about. No, you have to have situational awareness. What is going on around you? What's happening in Connecticut? We have all those numbers now. What's happening with the variants in Connecticut? That information is available to you. Even what's happening by local town, that information is available. So you can judge your risk more or less. Don't forget a lot of people you work with around here live in Danbury, so check Danbury out too, right? Check out uh, Waterbury as well. So check out the bigger cities that are nearby because a lot of people who are here are actually living there. So I think just situational awareness is the most important thing. I hope that's helpful. Yes, thank you so much. That was fantastic and very educational, eye-opening. Um, we are recording this program, so it'll be available um, 
on our website. If you go back to the event page, it'll be linked there. It'll also be on our YouTube page. If you just Google Minor Memorial Library YouTube, it'll be on there. Um, but give me a, give me a couple days, <laughs> a day or two. Um, again, thank you so much. Uh, this was fantastic. Um, I'm going to our neighbor Teresa. <laughs> yes, right down the street. Um, so I'm going to let everyone unmute themselves if they want to say thank you, say bye, and uh, I'm going to stop recording. So thank you again so much.